Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Cleft Palate Craniofacial Journals uh, audio and video podcast. We uh, we started doing videos a few months ago, and it's been really a lot of fun. So um, welcome to our listeners and our viewers. Uh, I'm Pat Chavarro. I am the, um, the podcast and video interview um, editor and host. I'm really excited uh, to be able to discuss this paper with you today because as with a lot of the papers, this is a topic that I think is important for a lot of different um, people on craniofacial teams. I know I, as a pediatric nurse practitioner, took care of lots and lots of kids with deformational plagiocephaly. And um, just a really interesting aspect uh, is covered in this paper. And two of the authors are here with me today. Um, so let me first let you know about this article that you can find on online first. Uh, it came out on January 18th. Uh, it is an original article and the title is Orthotic Helmic Therapy for Deformational Plagiocephaly, Stratifying Outcomes by Insurance. And there are a bunch of authors uh, from uh, the team at Yale, uh, and also um, from Cranial Technologies. And for those of us uh, in, uh, in cleft and craniofacial care, we know Cranial Technologies very well um, for the care that they help us provide our kids. So the authors are Sacha Ock, Adam June, Aaron Long, Giancarlo Rivera, Timothy Littlefield, Jacqueline in Inat, Hamali Shah, Nishida Pandugula, Mariana Almeida, David Alper, John Persing, and um, Michael Perovich. And full disclosure, I've known Mike since he was a baby resident and now is uh, an attending uh, at, uh, at Yale. So Mike, I just want to say I'm very proud of you and so happy to have both you and Sacha here today. So welcome. Thank you. Uh, we're, thank we're, you. It's an honor to be here, and thank you for, for inviting us, and it's also great to reconnect with you. It's, uh, it's been too long, so thank you yeah. and congratulations on running this great podcast. Oh, thanks so much. So first, uh, I always love to um, ask the authors, what made you, what made your group, and it's quite a big group, so it's, it's interesting to get different perspectives, is what made you decide to take a look at, at this area of our care? I, I think all of us who do cleft and cranial facial take care of a lot of patients with deformational plagiocephaly. I think in an effort to reduce the amount of sudden infant death syndrome, the unexpected or unintended consequence is the significant increase in deformational plagiocephaly, which was a non-entity probably 30 years ago and now has become something that affects one in eight children. Uh, and so a lot of our patients do come with uh, deformational plagiocephaly, and we found that there is a discrepancy in both timing of presentation, access to care, and results following uh, initiation of helmet therapy based on socioeconomic status. And uh, there are a lot of reasons it's multifactorial. I think part of it is access to care and insurance policies. I think part of it is compliance. I think part of it might be implicit bias on the part of providers. And one of the things we wanted to look at is if you control for all variables, timing of presentation, uh, you know, initial severity, is there a difference in outcomes for patients who are underinsured versus the commercially insured? Um, we were lucky that Cranial Technologies, and again, I have no financial or any type of personal relationship with Cranial Technologies other than it's one of the places that we refer patients to, but the, uh, Tim Littlefield at the organization was generous enough to open his book, so to speak, and give us access to several hundred thousand uh, patient uh, data so we could ev evaluate and analyze what factors are predictive for good outcomes. So, you know, just to your point about deformational plagiocephaly not being a thing, um, I, was, I was saying even before we started that when I started in 1988, uh, deformational plagiocephaly was not a thing. And it's so interesting that in 1992, with the Back to Sleep campaign, that we started getting inundated in our office, both our office and craniofacial and also um, by the pediatric neurosurgeon. So really, uh, it did become a thing. And I guess what is really interesting to me, uh, and we can certainly talk about it more uh, and think about it for future projects, is that over 30 years later, it's still a thing. And, uh, yeah. and as we look at, at your paper uh, 
and you know just some thoughts about you know what do we do to you know what do we do for this to become not a thing anymore you know so so interesting so really um maybe you could just give us a bit a little bit more of an overview of 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 what you found of your paper and then and then just talk about uh you know just talk about the your future with this and i wonder i hope that maybe you guys are going to do some more uh more work on this because certainly it was it, it's it's a it's a tough topic to to tackle there's just so many kids around the country and so many different variables so maybe give us a, a little bit more of a an overview Sasha, you want to jump in yeah of course um so i think like mike um you know outlined a little bit is we had this uh, quite a large data set here. It was a little bit over 200,000 patients in the United States um, over the last 10 years from, um, I think something like 40% of US states. Um, and what we were able to look at here is uh, define two outcome metrics. Uh, so once the patient arrived and they, they had access to treatment and that initial barrier was overcome, what was the likelihood that they exited treatment with a residual deformity? And we divided that into two groups as residual brachycephaly based on cephalic index and uh, residual uh, plagiocephaly based on uh, CVAI. And these were all just pre-cut metrics um, that were predefined. Um, and like Mike said, what's interesting is once you correct for a lot of the covariates that you would expect, like uh, delayed presentation in the Medicaid population or worse severity and, and all the relevant variants uh, that might impact our, our outcomes here, uh, what you see is that the Medicaid population is still 60% uh, more likely to have a residual brachycephaly and around 20% more likely to have a residual um, plagiocephaly. And, uh, and those are really interesting findings here because you're seeing it a lot at the national scale, but you're also seeing it more on the state level scale as well. So across the board, Medicaid populations were having worse outcomes, even once they were able to access treatment. Um, and we, we actually looked at this in a little bit of a different way as well, because when we use the craniometric data, it's a little bit more objective in, in nature. Um, but we also had physicians uh, assessments of how they, they thought the deformity had changed over the years and how it had, uh, or over the, the months of, of, of treatment. And what we found as well is that the Medicaid patients were over three times more likely to have poor outcomes as rated by the physician. So you kind of have this dual collaborate corroboration between the objective craniometric outcomes and then the physicians who are also saying treatment this patient probably wasn't as great as it can be. And, and again, this is while controlling for all the things that we already know are, exist. Like, you know, we know that Medicaid patients are gonna come present later to treatment. We know they're gonna have a hard time accessing treatment, but even when you control for these factors, um, there still seems to be a residual deformity in this population, independent of, 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 of the other factors we're aware of. Um, one thing I think is interesting too, is from the studies, since we had the state level data, um, you know, more or less across the board, you're seeing this trend, uh, pretty much in every state, but the parameter estimates, meaning the impact of these uh, of, of these overall odds ratios are not the same within each state. So it's interesting to see something uh, like Vermont where a, a, a patient is two times more likely to have a residual brachycephaly, but then you, you know, jump the border a few hundred miles down to New York and that difference is actually not even statistically significant. So it really speaks to kind of the, not only the multifactorial nature of how complex this is, but the impact that state level policy uh, really has here in kind of potentially determining what patients have access to what and how their outcomes are. It's really mind boggling, you know, and and for me, having taken care of hundreds of these kids, as I read the paper, I was trying to think about the obstacles, you know, I was thinking about because we um, at NYU and 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 I'm sure it is for you as well. We had a very uh, diverse population of patients, so we had those kids that uh, that had that you know had difficulty uh, getting um, just getting started on the process, and you know, and I have memories of insurance companies and getting uh, permission to getting authorization and getting started both for the insured, you know, for private insurance and for the Medicaid. So I keep trying to think about what is it that uh, is preventing the Medicaid patients? What, what, you know, is there one main thing that's preventing them from getting 
the, you know, getting better results, you know, and I guess one of the questions I had for you was when you're looking at, um, at the work that you did, uh, are you thinking um, that there were things that you didn't ask uh, that you didn't, you know, that that maybe would be something for future work that, you know, because I'm thinking, what is it, you know, what is it that is, you know, is, is there something that we're not getting, you know, um, like, what is it that is preventing these, these, the Medicaid patients from ha not having those outcomes that kept bugging me through the paper. And I was thinking of some of the patients that I had and what, you know, why, you know, are they not wearing it 23 hours a day? Are they, you know, what, what is it, you know, were you, you know, were you surprised by those findings? Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in on this. So I think there's, so I think there's definitely what Satya was referring to, there's a barrier just getting in the door. So if you right. look at some of these state by state policies, New York's not bad, but there are some states where if you have Medicaid, based on your state policy, you can't even get a helmet until you've done six months of conservative therapy. So imagine a baby shows up at five months and then you send them for a helmet. They say, no, you got to do six months of head turning. Well, now they're 11 months. And by the time they get the helmet, they're a year. So they've already missed that window. And so I think there's this, we, we have another, not to plug another paper, we have another paper in plastic and reconstructive oh. surgery looking at this very topic, uh, which has shown that state policy dictates outcomes. So more restrictive state policy, the Medicaid patients do worse. More accepting state policy, like Colorado, they actually do as well as a commercially insured or even better. So I think part of it is we, we see where policy uh, and governmental structure dictates, in many cases, patient outcomes. So I think once they get to the door, why are they having worse outcomes? And I think you, you hit the head, the nail on the head is, is a compliance and issue. Now, again, the way that we're rating compliance is subjective. It's a healthcare provider or an orthotist saying, I think they're wearing it, they're not wearing it. No one's actually in the home themselves. And we right. know that as providers, there's this, this potential for bias where you might assume someone isn't wearing it because of your own internal biases. So I, 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 that's, I think that's a shortcoming and that's, I don't know how to obviate that in sort of this methodology unless you actually are able to be in the home itself. But I think, um, there, there's a likely a compliance issue and there may be some barriers in either education or language that are impacting how patients are understanding the use of that helmet. And we definitely have patients who get a helmet. So they've come through the whole process of getting access to it, but then the child finds it itchy or they fussy and they don't wear it. And now all of a sudden they have the helmet, but they've worn it for three months, but on and off. And like I tell the families, the brain's always growing. The skull's always growing. Your sleep is growing, so you got to wear it all the time. But you'll find that there isn't that same compliance. So I think to my, to my thought in terms of an intervention, the way to prove it, other than being in the home, is to really have an arm and work with one of these companies and, and have some sort of uh, follow-up intervention model and see do those people with interventions do worse or better or the same as those without interventions. And my hope would be that with extra education, extra teaching, maybe language specific pamphlets that are in Spanish or they're in that patient's native language, maybe that leads to better compliance and better long-term outcomes. Yeah, you know, I think that, you know, again, I really sat for a long time um, with this paper thinking about our patient, you know, and and I guess one of the things that that I go back to <clears throat> is, you know, is there entry into the system? And I, I, you know, in terms of even just getting, and you mentioned it in your paper, even getting into the PCP office in the very beginning to, you know, to start looking and just examining. And I was saying to you, Mike uh, and Sacha, even before we started this this recording, is that you know, there are, you know, 30 years later, there are patients who come to us and are surprised when we say to them, well, you know, this is something that, you know, explaining to them why it happened, you know, and you, to your point about education, I think one of the things that I've learned from this paper uh, is that, you know, the education piece that that we as the craniofacial community, you know, not just educating the 
patient, but educating the professionals. And it's really interesting, and I'll never forget this, that, uh, that 30 years ago when I you know, first started to see this, I was at a meeting um, where they were talking about, they were very happy about the, the, the decreased incidence of SIDS. And when I stood up and said, well, you know, I work in craniofacial care and we're starting to see this problem. And the response that I got was, well, it's not really that big of a deal, you know, and and, and even now, you know, I um, I just find that that's one of the things that I really learned. This is I, this really shows me that the um, the prevention part of it is still something that is is lacking. And I know, and I was saying that I've had a number of kids with um, that I follow from infancy with clefts when they were coming in, say for their molding appointments, and I'm diagno I'm diagnosing their deformational plagiocephaly, and. And I'm thinking, now, as I'm reading the paper, I'm thinking, are those mainly the Medicaid patients or is it the private pay patients? You know, I've never, you know, yeah. I never, I never, in my head, I ever distinguished that. Yeah. But, you know, are you, Sacha, and I know, uh, you know, just both of you seeing these patients, you know, is that something that, that, you're, that, that you're thinking about, that you're seeing, you know, as, as you did this work, you know, what were you thinking of, um, what, what wasn't in the paper, for example, like, and I, you know, I, I just, it just made me think so much about my patients and me trying to figure out why you had the findings that you had. Yeah, I think that's, you know, I think that's the burning question of what we've been thinking about. Like, what is one of the main drivers towards this? And we were fortunately able to do a little bit of, of, of sub hoc additional analysis here to kind of see what the impact of compliance was for these patients, right? And, and I think, uh, as Mike outlined, you know, there's intrinsic bias to how we define compliance. And I think that's super important to recognize. Um, and, and unfortunately, we weren't able to include it in, in, in this paper here. But what we did find is that when we tried to build some additional models on a much smaller uh, data set that we, we had access to, uh, we did find that the Medicaid population, they were 60% less likely to be compliant with treatment. Um, and I think that's that's super important for us to kind of think about, um, not in the perspective that, you know, the Medicaid population, they're, they're not wearing their helmets, but uh, instead, of, it's it's more of a failure of the, our healthcare system and our physicians, because it means we're not educating these patients properly. They're not receiving the proper information to know how to put on their helmet, how to clean their helmet, how long they should be wearing their helmets. Um, and instead, this, this is a very marginalized group that we really have to pay attention with. So... Um, we did find that you know compliance was significantly lo lower in the Medicaid population, and when we did a, a state level analysis where we, you know, tried to uh, essentially run a, a correlation between the the likelihood of noncompliance and uh, residual deformity, we did have a correlation of, of something around like 0.4, uh, which you know said that there is a strong association between obviously noncompliance and residual deformity, but what that also tells us is that it's the trend is not entirely explained, right? Uh, you know, we're, we're, we see a, a trend of a correlation of 0.4. We know there's a strong association, but there's probably more to the picture. Um, and what that tells me is that compliance is probably one of the key ways that we can help um, Medicaid population have better outcomes in, in the long term. But there's also probably more to the picture that we're, we haven't been able to, to fully capture yet. Yeah, you know, one of the things I was thinking as we're just doing this is just in terms of, and you looked at kids that are being treated in all around the country. And so obviously you have many different providers. So, and when you have providers, you have both the um, the medical providers on the craniofacial teams, and then you have the providers from the orthotic companies. And one of the things I was thinking is that, you know, th is there a specific and the answer is no, there really isn't a specific protocol that is followed by everyone around the country in terms of, well, when you send the child for a helmet, you know, how often are you seeing them back? You know, the orthotic company has their own protocol. How often are we seeing them? And, you know, what are we teaching them? What are the, what are the people from the orthotic company educating them about? Are, are the orthotic company people expecting that we're educating more? Because I used to see this sometimes with patients where they'd come in and I'd say, well, you know, I'd say one thing and they'd say, well, the orthotic company is saying this, you know, and I just, that's one of the things I've been thinking of, you know, just in terms of, you know, of 
future projects to, to drill down a little bit more. You know, I mean, you did what you did was amazing. And especially the numbers that you had, it just made me wonder, you know, what is it that uh, that we as the craniofacial basal community can can do to help? Because it's multifaceted. I mean, it's it's prevention from the get go, and what one get. So made me do you know, one of the interesting papers I read um, as a partner, taking care of these patients, trying to think, well, what did I do wrong, or what did I do right, or what can I do better? You know, as I try to help. Uh, newer um, nurses and you know and, and nurse practitioners who are caring for these kids because education is such a big part of the work that I do I did that I do um, you know in, in my role uh, so I'm just I'm so glad that you guys did this because I think and and this is the kind of thing I think that we need to talk about and and present at meetings and talk to each other about it but also taking something like this. Like, you know, I was talking to my daughter, she's a pediatrician, it's like taking this to the AAP meetings yeah. and talking to them, you know? Yeah. Um, and, he, you know, so what, um, one of the things that I wanted to ask you was what, what did you leave out? Was there anything that, you know, that, that I don't, that, that when I read it, I don't, you know, I didn't know because it wasn't in there, but you guys know? Go ahead. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, the, another, a point that's probably not too well highlighted here, and, and I think it's, it's to the testament that we haven't spoken about it, is that the, the TRICARE population, meaning our military vets, they essentially had the, the same outcomes as the Medicaid population. Um, and this was in a small sample size uh, compared to, to the greater Medicaid population. But it's interesting to see that our, our military families, uh, right, who, who are insured through, through this insurance, are also having worse outcomes here. And that's something that, you know, we didn't really touch on um, in the discussion of our paper, or it's something that, that we didn't highlight at, at nearly as strongly as we probably should have. Uh, but I think important to recognize that these, some of these barriers, um, it might not all be entirely based on socioeconomic status. So we talked a little bit about, you know, compliance is a huge issue, but the impact that potential bias may have, right? Or the, the impact of, of being able to arrive to a center with care and, and have the, you know, the full time slot to speak to a physician and, and be educated. Uh, and I think the, the TRICARE population is, is a little bit of a testament uh, to that in our research that these barriers have, have more to do uh, than with just simply you know, socioeconomic status when, when we're looking at, it, at this analysis. And I, I think from my perspective, I think the most important message that I would want to impart on any listener is that this is in no way intended to be a criticism or an indictment of anyone of, based on insurance status. If anything, this is, a, for me, a reminder that we are still falling short to a major segment of our population, and we yeah. need to do more, and we need to do a better job of educating and enforcing compliance and emphasizing how they are equal partners in this. And coming from NYU, where I was fortunate to train, where you spent three decades, you, you see that with nasoalveolar molding, with families that are able to, if you're part of that solution, not only is the final cleft result better, but also parents feel empowered, that they have agency in their child's medical condition. And I think training and teaching and educating families to, to realize that you are a direct influence on how this child's head shape looks long term is really important. And I'm, I'm hopeful that there, the, the next iteration of this will be an intervention. And we can say, look, we identified a problem and this is how we address that problem. Yeah, I think it's so interesting that you related this to nasal alveolar molding because <clears throat> I remember that Dr. Cutting, um, the cleft surgeon who we w worked with, he always used to say to the parents, you know, that th this team is, you know, th every member of this team is very important. And you as the parents are a huge piece um, of the team to the success. And I think it's very, you know, very similar. And, and I do think that's true, that it really empowered the parents that they felt that their uh, compliance with that treatment uh, was really a, a big key to their child's um, their child's outcome. And, but and I do think though, with you know, with with helmet therapy, it goes beyond what we you know us in the craniofacial you know, as the craniofacial providers or the helmet uh, the orthotic companies as providers. 
I, I keep emphasizing that the the pediatric world they are so they could also be so helpful to the outcomes because we see them in, but the you know when they're going in for a, a well child visit that there's so much education there. So if I, if I was a, a, a pediatric NP in a, in a primary care practice and I had a child that was having, that had, was having helmet therapy, I would really want to be part of that uh, educational team and supporting that too. And, uh, and that's one of the things that, you know, that I'd love to look at in the future. And as I said, my daughter, uh, my young, my our youngest daughter, Gabby, um, is a pediatrician now. Don't you feel old, Mike? Yeah, yeah, I do. I do. I I, I remember. Yeah, I remember she was I think in college when I or high school yeah. or college. Yeah, when I first started. I, I mean, to to your point, most of the referrals to cranial technologies are not from cranial facial surgery. Uh, the majority came from pediatricians. Most of the people who are identifying recognizing, referring, and educating our pediatricians. So in some ways, we are preaching to the converted with craniofacial surgery. We're yeah. much too niche and much too small to accommodate all the kids who need this. So like you said, the really there needs to be uh, teaching and education through the AAP out of craniofacial surgery because that's the target group who really has the biggest influence on this population. Absolutely, absolutely. So... Um, I know that we, we're getting to the end of this. We could talk for forever about it. Uh, is there, um, so you were talking about other, other work for the, what, what are we, uh, what's on the horizon? What might we see, Sacha? Future works. Um, yeah. So I think something that's interesting to recognize is that we're talking a lot about uh, craniometric outcomes, right? And we have to realize that when you're taking the cephalic index and you're taking the CVAI, these are two-dimensional, essentially, measures that we're trying to impart onto a three-dimensional sphere, essentially. Um, so I think it's interesting to know when we're, we're, we're discussing, you know, this individual had worse outcomes based on these, you know, 2D measures uh, versus another individual, is what is the the relationship between you know these these 2D metrics and an actual object uh, subjective metric of, of of a physician looking at a infant's head and saying, well, this looks like it's moderate to severe, or this looks like it's severe, um, and I think this adds uh, an important component to this because as we you were just discussing, Pat, you know at times you have the cranial tech people who who will tell you, well, this this is one thing, and then you know they'll come into your office and you say, well, that's not exactly quite how I see it and, and trying to maybe rethink about how we're categorizing some of these uh, deformities is, is probably an important next step because I think we're, we're only as good as our tools, right? And uh, if anything, this study here has shown us that this, there's so much complexity related to what we, we classify uh, a child's outcome to be. So I think a good first step um, would be to see if we can improve our tools, see if, if, if we can speak in a language that has a little bit more concordance across the board, and then with that, be able to uh, target some of the drivers of, of disparities that we're seeing here in, in works like these. And Sacha, do you want to just touch base on the forthcoming uh, publication looking at state policy? Because I think that's worth mentioning as well, uh, and, and it's, it's prescient to some of the discussion we've had. Yeah, well, within our, you know, we a recent paper I think that we it's probably just went live on on, on PRS is is the impact that state policies have on uh, on on really understanding what are the main drivers not only towards uh, outcomes once you have them but also for access um, and what's really fascinating to see here is that we obviously have this federalist system here and we're seeing general trends across the board but not all the states uh, have the same findings you know uh, Mike pointed out that you know in Colorado we actually found that Medicaid patients had an easier time of, of accessing treatment than their commercial insurance. And then when you go to Colorado and you look at, well, what policies do they have for helmeting? They actually have higher reimbursement rates um, in, in general for the Medicaid population than they would for uh, the private insurance population. And that's, it makes a lot of intuitive sense, you know, when you po properly compensate phys physicians for their work or for their uh, you know, equipment, you will have uh, an easier access towards uh, getting treatment. Uh, I think that's, that's, that's an essential finding for us to keep in mind. I mean, you had, you had asked, Pat, what, what makes, you know, why is there a difference between New York and Vermont? 
And I think, you know, there's a lot of reasons and I think education and like you said, follow up uh, both by the, the physicians, the nurse practitioners, but also by the orthotists and how they, how they work together and synergize in, in terms of treatment. Uh, and then fu fundamentally, I also think state policy, local policy does impact your local patient population. I've seen that in Connecticut. I've gone to Hartford and we've done some advocacy for some of our deformational plagiocephaly kids. It used to be extremely hard to get a helmet. And when they've, they've said you have to have developmental delay to have a helmet, which we've now shown through other publications, that's not actually what you're gonna find in the overwhelming majority of patients, but that was a, a barrier. And as a result, most patients couldn't get a helmet because they didn't have developmental delay at six months. So I think that's something that hopefully is, is I, again, this is bringing awareness and hopefully the next step is to have an intervention and to show what you do in the state house impacts how these little kids get affected. Uh, and I think that's something that we all, um, as you know, we, we work locally. Most of us don't have an MPH, don't do public policy. We work on an individual patient basis. And that I think is satisfying, but also we are subject to some of the, the greater policies that we live in. And we need to understand how those impact uh, the care that we do provide. Well, I have to say this is, you know, great work, uh, really important. Um, I, I can't believe that, you know, 30 plus years later, you know, we're still tackling this issue, but I'm glad to see Sacha, some new blood coming in and Mike, you know, trying to, you know, to work on this. And, uh, and again, um, to anyone who's listening, um, this is something, this is a paper everyone needs to read if you're taking care of kids. Um, with uh, deformational plagiocephaly. So let me, uh, let me uh, give you the info on this paper. Go read the whole thing, really excellent. Uh, this is uh, an original article in the Cleft Palate Craniofacial Journal. It's online first, it came out January 18th, hot off the press. And it is orthotic helmet therapy for deformational plagiocephaly, stratifying outcomes by insurance by um, the group, a great group at, at Yale, uh, Sacha Ock, Adam June, Aaron Long, Giancarlo Rivera, Timothy Littlefield, Jacqueline Ignat, Hemali Shah, Nishita Pangulula, Mariana Almeida, David Alpert, Persing, and my friend, Mike Alperovich. Um, I feel like such a mom, you know, seeing you, Mike. <laughs> Um, it's great to connect with you. It's wonderful to see you again. And thank you for doing this. This is a great medium. And I think this is, this is great for CPCJ. It's great for uh, cleft and cranial facial surgery. So I think this is fantastic. And Sasha, best of luck to you in the future. I know you're going to do thank great. You. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having thank us. Thank you, Pat. Bye. All right. Bye-bye.